Today's podcast is brought to you by Jerry Robinson's Pace Portfolio. Learn how to shield your investments from economic uncertainty with this complete do-it-yourself portfolio package. Learn more at paceportfolio.com. That's P-A-C-E portfolio.com. Welcome to the cutting edge of the global awakening. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. Well, it looks like the North Tower of the World Trade Center has just completely collapsed. The U.S. dollar's status as the preeminent reserve currency is under attack. This is a mathematical fact. Tens of trillions of dollars are being extracted from the United States of America. You really want the truth? Then just follow the money. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio, a broadcast dedicated to your personal, spiritual, and financial liberty. And now, here's your voice of reason in the midst of global chaos, economist and best-selling author, Jerry Robinson. Ah, friends, welcome to today's broadcast. So glad that you're joining us. We're on the web at ftmdaily.com. You can find us there every single day, cranking out all kinds of information for you about your personal, spiritual, and financial liberty. We believe that these are very trying times. As you look around the globe today, you are confronted with the fact that we are in uncharted territory. No matter if you look at the uh, global political situation, the geopolitics of our world, or even and especially, I should say, the economies of the world, as this debt-based monetary system that we have created just continues down the path and it is completely unsustainable. And it's becoming very obvious to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. We have a very exciting show for you lined up today. I'm joined, as always, by my lovely wife, co-host, and national director of our Christian Financial Advisor Network. It's Jennifer Robinson. Jennifer, great to have you this morning. Thanks, Jerry. It's really good to be here on this Wednesday morning. We do have an exciting show. We have a special guest today. There's a new book out this year called The Money Bubble, What to Do Before It Pops. And it's authored by James Turk and John Rubino. And John Rubino will be here on the show today joining us for an interview talking about some different things in his new book and what he sees coming for this economy, gold and silver, and many other topics. You know, back in 2004, these two authors wrote another book and advised readers back in 2004 to bet against the housing prices and to buy gold and silver. And those were two of the best trades of the decade. So uh, we've got John Rubino here and we're really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Yeah, we'll get our good friend John Rubino on the program here shortly. He's uh, standing by. Before we do, uh, just a real quick update for those of you who have been paying attention to this BRICS bank, this BRICS development bank. Uh, There's been this quiet revolution brewing around the globe. Five global powers seeking to merge and harness their collective political power and economic might to directly confront and challenge American hegemony. And those countries are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They're known as the BRICS nations. And it's become very clear that they're not just seeking to disrupt our modern and greatly diseased global financial order but they intend to challenge the very foundations of our current global financial order by striking at the heart of Western financial institutions that undergird the current system. So it was very interesting to see this week that the BRICS nations actually launched the BRICS Development Bank, which will be headquartered in Shanghai after a little bit of a debate. There was a debate whether it would be uh, headquartered in Shanghai, China, or whether it would be uh, in New Delhi. India wanted it, as well as uh, Brazil. Brazil also wanted to have the bank uh, located there. But it turns out that the bank is going to be headquartered in Shanghai. It'll be presided over by a president from India, and the chairman of the board will hail from uh, Brazil. The bank is going to be initially capitalized with $50 billion contributed equally by all five countries. And the bank itself is going to directly compete with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So this is not some sort of augmentation or it's not some sort of addendum to those uh, banks. Instead, it's a direct challenger. Uh, In fact, they're promising that they're going to provide even better services to emerging nations 
uh, than the World Bank, and they won't have all the strings attached. Now, this is really Washington's problem. You know, Washington does not want to see this happen. Washington runs the World Bank. They run the uh, IMF. They're, of course, the IMF is based in Washington, and that's been the big beef. China especially, but also India and Brazil and Russia have been complaining about how Western-centric the World Bank and the IMF have been. And uh, back, I guess it was about 2010, the IMF decided to make a shift to deliver more influence to emerging nations, especially China. And this deal agreed to increase the voting rights of developing and emerging countries by about 6%. Problem was, the deal uh, required approval by the U.S. Congress, and the U.S. Congress slapped it down. And this, of course, outraged the BRICS nations. And to this day, U.S. lawmakers still refuse to agree upon the proposal. So the BRICS countries have now come up with this BRICS development bank, which has been in the works for some time. And they're still barking at the Congress saying, will you change the way the IMF and the World Bank are structured per the agreement that was reached? And the Congress uh, is still not wanting to budge on it. However, now with the BRICS Bank in place and now with Washington's monopoly on global lending now suddenly threatened, uh, perhaps Congress will suddenly find time to revisit that 2010 draft deal. We'll see if the launching of this BRICS development bank will have any impact upon the Congress and get them to move in the emerging nation's favor. So we're keeping our eyes on this because it does represent another challenge to the dollar. It represents another challenge to the U.S. economy as a whole. And therefore, we're going to keep our eyes on it and keep you posted on it. So with all that said, let's uh, go ahead and head over now to our good friend, John Rubino. He's here to talk about his brand new book, The Money Bubble. Uh, Let's go to that interview right now. All right, joining me on the line today is our good friend, John Rabino. He is the author of a brand new book that came out this year, co-authored with James Turk of goldmoney.com. And the title of the book is The Money Bubble, What to Do Before It Pops. John Rabino is a friend of the show. He's been on our program numerous times. You also know him from dollarcollapse.com. That's the site that he publishes and updates news each and every day so faithfully. John, thanks for uh, coming on Follow the Money Daily. Hey, Jerry. Uh, Great to talk to you again. Absolutely. You're doing a great work over at dollarcollapse.com. That site so inspired me uh, whenever we launched our site. And it's just old faithful. I can always go on to dollarcollapse.com and see brand new headlines that are coming out about gold and about the economy. I think you're doing a great work over there. And now you have a brand new book, The Money Bubble, uh, What to Do Before It Pops, that you co-wrote with James Turk, just as you did with your last book. Last book also was a fantastic book that came out about the collapse of the dollar. Uh, How is this book different, John? What have you done to this book that's different from the last book? Well, so much has happened in the last 10 years. that This book is almost all new material. You know, there's a little bit of background where we have to explain, for instance, what is money and uh, and how does gold um, function as money in the world. But otherwise, it, it's basically a chronicle of the uh, the even bigger mistakes that we've made since the uh, the housing bubble in the middle of the last decade. And th- those mistakes have been uh, really notable. You know, we uh, instead of learning from the near death experience that uh, the, the financial markets of the world endured in 2008, 2009, we basically rolled the dice and, and we doubled down on all the um, policies and uh, the procedures that uh, that created the crisis in the first place. The, uh, the big banks have been allowed to get bigger and their derivatives books are absolutely immense now. I, I saw the other day that uh, they're approaching a quadrillion dollars of notional value in derivatives, which gives us a new illion that we have to keep track of. And And um, governments of the world have borrowed uh, absolutely insane amounts of money. And now they've convinced via extremely low interest rates, once again, um, individuals to start borrowing a lot of money. So whereas before we had um, subprime mortgages as the epicenter of the crisis, now we've got student loans and subprime auto loans 
that that people are taking out um, in amounts that make it almost impossible for them to manage going forward. So we we basically set the stage for um, another round of uh, of financial crises around the world, only bigger, more extreme, and uh, and possibly devastating for a lot of people. So the book is about uh, you know how we got here and and the mistakes that I just uh, outlined and what we can do about it. Because as individuals, we can't stop this process. You know, there, there's nothing you can do at the ballot box or anywhere else that is going to derail this train. Uh, but we, what we can do as individuals is begin to plan to protect our families and maybe make some money from the process because uh, crises uh, also equal opportunities. You know, you... you uh, You'll, you'll see things go down, of course, a lot of things go down, but a lot of things go up. So we, we should be planning to um, to invest in the things that are likely to go up uh, with the eye of uh, at least staying even and possibly making a lot of money when uh, the next big crisis hits. John, let's go back and explore what you just said about not being able to change this trajectory that we're on at the ballot box, because I think there are some out there who would disagree. I certainly agree with you. I am completely of the opinion. And as you've said before, and has, and and as I said before, that now is not the time to spend debating, you know, why would you argue about the meal on the Titanic, get on a lifeboat, get off the boat, we'll sort everything out later, but build that case a little bit as to why we are so advanced in this decline that not even a, a great politician getting in could solve it. Help us understand that. Sure. Well, let's look what has happened over the last 15 or so years. You know, you had the Republicans take over the government in um, in the early stages of George W. Bush's uh, administration when they, they controlled Congress and the White House. And the Republicans are, in theory, the uh, the, the party of small government. Well, did, did government shrink? Were they, were they out there, uh, you know, chopping whole departments out of the government and, and cutting back on, on all kinds of extraneous spending that they, they've been complaining about for all these years? No, the, the government actually got bigger under George W. Bush. Taxes went up. Um, entitlements, new entitlements were created. So um, then we got a, a Democrat administration coming in under Barack Obama. And you would think that the Democrats would cut way back on the military because that's uh, the, one of their major policy um, thrusts and uh, allow, of course, entitlement spending to go up. But at least it would balance out if they're cutting something. Well, they didn't cut that either. Military spending went up under Barack Obama. So basically, whoever's in charge, the system is going to do what the system's going to do because it's not, no longer under the control of the politicians. Um, uh, we have what what you would think of as institutional momentum right now, where the, the government is going to continue to grow because it's really impossible to cut. There's just no political will for scaling back the size of the government, which means it's going to have to continue to borrow more money each year. And the Federal Reserve is going to have to continue to create more new currency to fund all the debts we're taking on. And so the uh, the, the size of our indebtedness and um, everyone else's indebtedness too, because every other major country is in the same boat. You know, our, our, our burden is going to get bigger and bigger and our financial fragility is going to get more and more severe until something happens to blow the system up. You know, the, the market's going to reimpose discipline on us. And um, it, it's probably going to be via some kind of catastrophic reset of the system where either we have a, a 1930s style depression in which huge amounts of debt are wiped out by default, or we'll have some kind of a, a rising inflation and, and massive currency devaluation. Um, Maybe not as bad as Weimar Germany in the 1920s, but who knows, you know, where, where the value of these major fiat currencies around the world go down dramatically, which means you as a saver, if you've got a, a dollar based bank account, um, you're the one who's hurt by that. And so either way, it's going to be perceived by the, the average guy as turmoil, just, you know, one crisis after another and, and uh, problems that are absolutely unfixable. Um, and we can't stop this process because there's nobody we can vote for who has um, policies that are on the uh, the doable part of the political spectrum 
um, that's out there. You know, only Ron Paul is talking about things that might actually help. And he gets, what, 7% of the vote in national elections now. You know, that we, we really don't yet buy into the idea that there are limits on what we can do because uh, most Americans have never lived in a time of sound money. You know, 1971 was the last time we had a currency that was in any way connected to anything real. And since that time, we haven't had to prioritize because we've had the world's reserve currency and we've been able to just create as much uh, new currency as we wanted to do anything we wanted to. So we, we build a global military empire and we build a cradle to grave entitlement state and we paid for it all with borrowed money and newly created currency. So we're past the point where there's any kind of a policy fix, which, which means that uh, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that politics flat out don't matter. But we're almost at that point where the debate is around things that um, that won't fix anything. You know, there's no immigration policy that's going to solve our problems. There's no health care law that would, uh, if we put it into into place, would uh, would let us suddenly wake up to a, a well-run, sustainable country. You know, there's nothing like that. There's no magic tax rate or no magic interest rate um, that would fix things because we've borrowed too much money. And uh, that debt works the same way for a, a government and a country as it does for an individual, which is to say that if you borrow too much, your life begins to spin out of control. And we're, we're deeply into the spinning out of control phase of that process now. Yeah, it does seem that we're trying to cut the tree down by hacking at the branches, and that's not going to work. You know, we pointed that out last time. I think we, you and I even talked about it during the 2012 presidential debate. There was not a mention at all of the Federal Reserve in the debates, Uh, It was a a topic that wasn't even brought up, uh, despite the fact that the Fed had moved in an unprecedented way into the markets and had disrupted the markets with its QE1, 2, and 3, and yet the presidential candidates didn't even touch it, uh, as if it was a taboo topic that was not supposed to be discussed or that the American public wouldn't understand it even if they did, was the kind of idea that you walked away with. And I think we're staring at the same thing. I My stomach turns a little bit, John, as I think about the 2016 presidential election cycle and all of the uh, non-stories uh, that are going to be popping up. Meanwhile, this fragile economic system that we have continues to march towards its death. And I want to talk about the death of this system here in a moment. But first, you brought up the Federal Reserve and uh, how it's continuing to kick the can down the road with its policies. It has indicated that in November, it's going to stop the current QE3 process. It'll completely be wound down. Do you believe that? And if so, what does that mean? And what is that going to look like in your opinion? Well, so far, um, tapering ha- has been kind of an interesting process, and uh, you know it fits into the category of, of them fooling us, really, because as the the Federal Reserve has has bought back fewer and fewer Treasury bonds, um, somebody over in Belgium has been buying um, an equal amount of Treasury bonds, and so whether there was a deal struck, obviously there there must have been some kind of a deal struck, um, oh, but. Um, because of um, the uh, the buying on on um, Belgium's part, we haven't actually had tapering because somebody else has been doing the buying that the the Fed has not been doing. And if that process continues, then tapering is really a non-event. You know, we we're just shifting the money around. So, do you think they're actually going to stop in November, or do you agree with people like Peter Schiff who say no, we're going to continue to see them uh, actually have to raise the amount of uh, QE that they're well, doing? if QE has been one of the factors that that has been keeping interest rates low, or very, very artificially low, and it goes away, then you would expect interest rates to normalize. That is to go back to levels that are pretty consistent with the the last 30 or 40 years, which would approximately triple the the interest rate that the US government pays on its debt going forward. So what what would happen then is that uh, we borrowed a whole lot of short-term money out there, several trillion dollars a year has to be rolled over uh, and if it, if it has to be rolled over at higher and higher rates, that means our interest costs go up. And that means our deficits expand by the amount of the increased interest costs. So it would blow up our budget. <clears throat> you know, let, let interest rates go to an average level of 6% in the U.S., which is kind of what we paid back in the, uh, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s on average. And um, 
you would see the U.S. having to pay a trillion dollars a year in just interest, you know, and, and that would be the same for everybody else in the world. Japan's budget would absolutely blow up if they just had to go back to our current average interest rate. And Europe couldn't manage if uh, their debts, which are really equivalent to ours, um, had to be rolled over at higher and higher rates. So, so if QE is the reason interest rates are so low and we do away with QE, then then the world ends <laughs> as we know it. You know, government finances are just completely blown out of the water over the next couple of years. So uh, I agree with Peter Schiff that it, it, it's a, a, a path filled with landmines for the governments of the world. And uh, interest rates should go back up in a, in a growing economy without artificial pressure on them. And if they don't, then something else very serious is wrong. Or there's something being done behind the scenes to offset quantitative easing. And that's really what's happened in the last few months. So um, if Belgium, for instance, were to stop buying treasuries and the U.S. were to continue to buy fewer and fewer treasuries, then you'd expect interest rates to go up dramatically. So that's how we'll tell if they're really doing it. If they're really tapering, you'll, you'll see interest rates rise. And if interest rates don't rise, that means somebody out there is still artificially depressing interest rates and nothing has really changed. Only the names have changed of who's doing the buying. So we'll see. Right now, they're, they've been fooling us. And if they um, stop fooling us and start telling the truth, we will know it in the interest rate uh, part of the bond market. My guest today is John Rubino. He is the author of a brand new book, a co-author with James Turk of a book entitled The Money Bubble, What to Do Before It Pops. John, uh, we talk about the death of this economy. We, obviously, you're pointing to that in your book. You're pointing to the fact that this fragile fiat currency system, debt-based monetary system is doomed, uh, cannot continue on forever. Do us a favor and just play out a possible scenario as to how this thing breaks down. Give us an idea that helps us understand how this thing may implode that way people can prepare for it. Sure. Well, we've created the conditions in which um, the global financial system is incredibly fragile. It can't handle an external shock. So one thing that could happen is um, that the, the incipient war in the Middle East spreads and causes um, oil prices to go up. So let's say gas goes to six or seven dollars um, a gallon in the U.S. That's like a massive tax increase. So more and more people won't be able to pay their bills. They'll default on their car loans and their mortgages. And the banks then find out that um, they're they're generating heavy losses on their loan portfolios, and they start to fail. Then the system starts to spin out of control. And you, you see the government step back in with even bigger quantitative easing. You know, they'll have to bail out all the banks and push down interest rates again. And that um, will finally shake the, um, the confidence that people have in these fiat currencies. We will figure out at long last that uh, it's, it's government policy to push down the value of our money year after year after year, and nobody will want to hold currencies anymore. We'll start immediately when we get paid swapping our dollars or euros or yen for real stuff. That will push up the price of real stuff, which will manifest as hyperinflation, um, which will just crash the system. You know, interest rates will have to spike in relation to or in response to interest rates going up or, or inflation going up. And uh, those higher interest rates will basically uh, blow up the leverage speculating community. And, and so the system will just start to spin out of control. All the parts will stop working and each will become a feedback loop for the other, making it harder and harder to function. And so uh, the system will just grind to a halt. And at that point, um, you know, if you're stuck with a big bank account, for instance, of dollars, you know, your dollars become a lot less valuable and your life savings just evaporate. And so what we'll end up doing in response to that, probably, is to go back to some kind of sound money. We'll, we'll devalue our currencies dramatically versus gold, go back to a gold standard, let's say, which is great for the people who own gold, terrible for the people who own those currencies that are being devalued. And that's what we should be looking at, how to shift our finances um, in such a way that we are protected from this process and maybe make a lot of money. And, you know, precious metals are one thing that will probably go up. Farmland is another. Energy assets is um, yet another. And there, there are several others that you can invest in um, and, and have a pretty good prospect of making money when all of this hits the fan. And um, so... Again, since we can't affect the political process, we can't stop these big banks from making these horrible mistakes. What, all we can do is, is tend our own gardens. 
and um, shift our finances around to um, to be prepared for this when it happens. John, uh, I can't agree with you more. I wish we had more John Rabinos out there saying this, that telling people to tend their own gardens, to focus on taking care of themselves, taking care of their families, doing what they can, instead of going out and trying to reform uh, or actually patch a hole in the bottom of the Titanic. I think that's a that's such an important point you're making, uh, John. I was also interested to see in your book, you have a chapter 18 entitled Cryptocurrencies, Revolution or Trap. How does Bitcoin fit into this entire scenario that you've painted? And what do you think? We don't have the benefit of having the hindsight on how these cryptocurrencies turn out. But if you had to break out your crystal ball, do you think that Bitcoin becomes a replacement for gold in the future because it actually serves as an external currency outside of the system? It's decentralized. Does Bitcoin become a major challenger to gold and does it is it victorious against gold or is Bitcoin simply a fad? What say you? Well, I think the concept of cryptocurrencies, that is something that uh, works as a payment system outside the, uh, the the normal banking system with you know central banks not controlling it and and uh, it, it operating beyond the scope of most governments i think that's a fascinating idea and i think it's an idea whose time has probably just about come because we can do it technically now um, but i don't think that cryptocurrencies are uh, direct pe- competitors of gold i think they're they're payment systems so in that sense they're competitors of fiat currencies you know they're they're a threat to the dollar but uh, they're not a threat to gold because they don't have physical reality. You know, you can get gold coins and, and you put them in a safe place and they are untouchable. You know, you know they're there and uh, they, they can't be taken away from you at, by government policy. And on the other hand, with, uh, with something like um, Bitcoin, it exists on, say, an online wallet that can disappear, or it can be regulated by governments, or it can be hacked by the NSA. You know, this is a system that uh, right now seems to be secure, but uh, once it becomes a threat to um, the other currencies of the world, you know they're going to go after it in some way. Maybe it's regulatory uh, policy, or maybe it's um, secret hacking or whatever. So we, we don't know how well Bitcoin will stand up to something like that. And in any event, because it doesn't have a physical reality, it's not money in the sense that gold is money, you know, an absolutely risk free asset. So in that sense, it's more like the dollar, which also doesn't have any physical reality anymore and uh, which is extremely convenient to use as a a payment system. It's almost friction free um, transactions that you can do with dollars. You can also do the same thing with Bitcoin. And it's even Bitcoin even has less friction when you're uh, transferring it, especially from one country to another than the dollar does. So in that sense, cryptocurrencies are uh, direct competitors and direct threats to these fiat currencies, which is yet another reason why fiat currencies are a bad idea, because uh, now there's a a technological reason why they why we don't have to have them. So um, I think the process of Bitcoin and its successor cryptocurrencies uh, playing out and you know seeing how they work in, in the real marketplace is going to be fascinating and uh, that, there's there are whole books in that story and uh, I wouldn't presume to have the technical understanding um, that would allow me to predict how it's all going to play out but I think they're fascinating and I think uh, somebody wanting to use bitcoins is completely justified in doing so I, I think that uh, as long as it's dollars that you're swapping into your bitcoin account rather than gold uh, you're, you're doing something that uh, might turn out well for you. Since you brought up gold, John, one of the things I'd like to get your take on is this London gold fix that's being overhauled. It's about a 95-year-old institution or tradition. These four banks have gotten together and set the daily London gold fix, and uh, now it's it's come underneath heavy regulatory scrutiny, and now they're talking about shaking it up. Of course, they are on the cusp of it. Can you describe what that really is for our folks in a real simple term, the London gold fix and also the silver fix, which is also going to be uh, changing up, I believe, next month. Sure. Well, the, the idea is that if, if you've got contracts based on something like gold or silver, you need a, a daily price. You know, there has to be a, a August 17th price for gold and silver for those contracts to uh, uh, to be executed on. And, and so the um, as you said, several big banks would get together each day and they would set a price for gold on that day. 
But it turns out that they were they were manipulating that price uh, for their own benefit, and they were front running it, where they would do trades based on what the the price was going to be set at. And and you know, not a surprise. Almost every market these days is corrupted in some way and manipulated in some way. So it should be no surprise that the the gold fix was was yet another example of that. So that is going away now. And what it's replaced with isn't clear yet, but there, there needs to be some kind of a, um, a number that contracts can use. And so, you know, it might just be um, a, a, the trade that happens at a given moment in time during the day where they, uh, where they say, okay, that, that was today's price, that trade right there. Or they'll, they'll go back to some other kind of uh, institution setting a price at a certain time. I don't know. Um, that's one aspect of the manipulation of the gold market. And I don't think it's the major one because this is, uh, you know, they were changing day, daily prices slightly in order for their traders to be able to uh, to make a small profit in the moment. Uh, the, the bigger gold and silver manipulation, of course, is, uh, is being done by governments where central banks um, dump gold on the market via big bullion banks like JP Morgan Chase uh, that pushes down the price of, of gold and shakes out the longs, you know, people who are betting on gold going up, it, it punishes them and and, uh, and causes them to be less aggressive about buying. And that's been the big story in the gold market, I think, of the last few years. And that also is slowly coming to light. And it's uh, it's nearing the end of its uh, its functional life because you've got the Asians, you know, Chinese and uh, Chinese people and, and Indians and, and Russians are buying all the gold that's being made available by this process. And they're locking it away. You know, you aren't going to see China or Russia dump their gold back on the market anytime soon because for cultural reasons and for economic strategy reasons, they, they want real money and they understand that gold is real money. So they're buying it up at this depressed price. And uh they're they're emptying out the Western vaults. You know, there's there's a lot of speculation um, now about how little the Western central banks have, and nobody really knows the number for sure. But it, it's got to be a lot less than they're actually reporting because that that's the only place this much gold could come from. You know, we know how much is flowing into China, and it's pretty much uh, all the gold that is coming out of the the world's gold mines. And so whatever else is being bought by India and Russia and the rest of the world has to be coming from somewhere. And it's got to be the central bank vaults. So um, at some point, that's that's where the gold market gets really interesting when uh, when it comes to light that central banks have basically dumped a lot of their gold on the open market and they can't get it back. <laughs> and at that point, you see a short squeeze, in other words, where, where everybody decides they want gold because it's, it's suddenly in shortage. And the people who are short gold, who are betting that it'll go down, um, get steamrolled. And then they have to buy back their short contracts at ever higher prices. And you'll see the price go through the roof. So that's out there for the gold market. And it'll, when it happens, it'll happen pretty quickly and suddenly. And uh, so I think you, you need to get your gold now, even if the next year is not that favorable, you know, even if it goes down a little bit in, um, in the short run, you need to be prepared for when it spikes up. And, uh, and as I said, when it happens, it'll happen probably without a lot of um, advance warning. And so if you're not in, you, you don't really have a chapter to be in. Toward the end of your book, you have a couple of chapters you and James Turk wrote uh, one chapter is called The Case for $10,000 Plus Gold, and the second chapter of those two is called The Case for $100 Plus Silver. Those are some fairly high numbers. Those are probably higher than some estimates that I've seen, but certainly believe that it's possible. How how much do you believe that's going to happen, and how long do you think it'll take for us to reach that place? You've got to admit, looking back uh, for the last several years, the central planners have been able to stave this off and suppress the gold price for some time. How long do you think they can continue doing it? Yeah, well, the the, the central planners will be able to play their games um, until it comes to light that they're playing games, you know, and, and there's no way to know when that's going to happen. It might be, uh, you know, a... Um, Edward Snowden-esque leak of some internal documents that show just how little gold is left in the uh, the vaults of the central banks. We well, don't know that, how that's going to. Wouldn't play that out. be nice? That would be yeah. great. Oh, that I'd would love, be awesome, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'd love but to but see you know, it, it, as I said, it, if that happens, then that's that's the end of uh, low gold prices. That you know, that day they're going to spike up by a couple of hundred dollars an ounce, and and if you weren't in, you you missed that boat. But um, 
the ten thousand dollar gold number is is based on research uh, and analysis that James has done that equates the amount of paper currency, fiat currency that exists in the world, with the price of gold. In other words, how how much gold do you need, and at what price to balance? The, uh, the fiat currencies that exist out there. And because the, uh, the amount of fiat currency in the world has been soaring over the past um, 20 or 30 years, uh, the price of, and, and the, the, the supply of gold has been growing very slowly. The gap between those two uh, has become gargantuan. And to bring them back into balance, there are three or four different formulas that James has come up with. And uh, they, they range in their results from about $8,000 an ounce gold to get us there to uh, fifteen dollars or $20,000 an ounce. So we took $10,000 as a nice round number, but the, the range is actually much wider than that. And it could be quite a bit higher. And again, it's not, it's not because gold is changing in any way or becoming any more valuable or functional than it's ever been. It's because because the supply of fiat currencies is soaring. And so basic supply and demand, you know, to bring things back into balance, you, you've got to have gold's price go up. For instance, if we're going to return to a gold standard, um, it's got to be at a level that, um, that makes it possible to exchange dollars for gold, right? Because that's the idea of a gold standard. It, you, uh, you maintain the value of your currency by making it um, exchangeable for gold. So that if we create too many dollars, then people will just swap them all for gold and, uh, and that'll take dollars out of circulation. So to get to that point where people would be willing to hold dollars and the supply of dollars versus the uh, the supply of gold are, are basically in balance, you need to get to a much higher gold price. And, and $10,000 an ounce, when you look at the amount of fiat currency that's out there in the world, it becomes very reasonable. <laughs> and uh, and it's consistent with past big spikes in the precious metals market. You know, gold went up in the 1980s when we had our last currency crisis by an amount that would, if it went up by the same percentage amount today, would take it well beyond $10,000 an ounce. And silver, um, the hundred dollar silver would uh, would be a one hundred to one ratio with gold at ten thousand dollars an ounce for gold, which is uh, at the really high end of the the ratio. So silver could go a lot higher. You know, historically, um, the ratio between gold and silver prices were about fifteen to one. So if we go back to historical levels, you could see five hundred dollar an ounce silver, and we just didn't want to throw a number out there that was that that big because that that sounds grossly unrealistic <laughs> from today's price, but um, it, it's not out of the range of possibility in terms of history. So silver could be a rocket ship when the time comes. You know, just to get back to normal historical ratios, if gold is rising, silver has to rise much more dramatically. Final question. I realize you're not a financial advisor. You can't give out dispense financial advice, but you can share some of the things that perhaps you're doing or that you know that other wise people are doing with their finances to prepare for such a situation as this. Give out some information to the folks who perhaps are bewildered by what you've said, or perhaps they, uh, you know, they're not really sure if they're prepared. What are some of the things that you recommend in the book, and what are some of the things you personally do to insulate yourself and your family from what you see coming? Yeah, well, the, the main thing that you don't want to do now is you don't want to depend on a fiat currency. If it's explicit government policy, which it is, to make the dollar less valuable year after year, and then to lie about the process, uh, you don't want to depend on dollars as your um, as, as the basis of your financial life. You don't want that to be your life savings. So you don't want investments that pay you dollars, that depend on dollars for their value. And bonds and bank accounts and things like that are, are therefore what you want to avoid. Because a bond, you know, a government bond or a corporate bond or, or any other kind of contract that pays you a certain number of dollars year after year and then gives you back your dollars principal at the end is going to get less and less valuable as the value of the dollar goes down. So instead, what you want is stuff that governments can't make more of in infinite quantities. So gold and silver, obviously, they're, they're kind of money that uh, you have to dig out of the ground. And we've only gotten about 2% more a year for, for 3,000 years. It's very hard to get more gold and silver. So the supply is going to be fairly stable. And therefore, the dollar value of gold and silver will go up as the dollar goes down. Um, same thing with um, natural resources. You know, Farmland has been going up dramatically lately. And the reason for that is because you can't make more farmland and unless you're going to bulldoze suburbia and turn it back into farms. And, and that's, a, that's a question for a later day. <laughs> you know, mostly that's not happening right now. 
and um, energy resources. You know, Exxon, for instance, owns oil, oil wells around the world, and you can't make new oil wells very easily. So they will go up in value relative to dollars. So if you buy stock in a company like that, you're, you're basically getting a share of some real assets. And it goes on and on. You know, there are lots of commodity-based mutual funds and natural resource stocks, and they will tend to do well in, in times when currencies and the instruments that are based on currencies are, are doing badly. So financially, that's what you want to do. And then for the rest of your life, um, you, you really want to um, avoid dependence on these big systems. For instance, if, if Social Security and Medicare are, uh, are what you think will take care of you later in life, you're probably going to be disappointed because government are going to run out of money in um, the scenario that you and I are talking about, Chair. So you, you want to um, become as involved in your local community as possible. Buy local food, be on uh, various kinds of committees and, you know, help people now and they will help you later. And uh, that's, of course, good advice for any stage of life, anytime. You know, it's the thing we, we should be doing, but we've gotten away from because we've grown accustomed to depending on the federal government to take care of us. So we need to go back to, uh, in, in some ways, uh, the, the way things were in the 1950s and 40s and 30s, where we, uh, we trusted the people closest to us because we could see them eye to eye. We could judge their character um, with our own eyes. And we don't have to worry about whether this politician or that politician in Washington is working for a benefit because they're probably not. Um, but we can know whether our mayor and our city council are, are doing what they should be doing. So that's the level, uh, you know, the term for that is the shrinking trust horizon. Uh, uh, Catherine Austin Fitz at uh, the Solari Network talks about this a lot. And I, I, I agree that that's a crucial idea right now. You know, we have, um, we will grow to trust fewer and fewer people closer and closer to home as the big systems start to spin out of control. And so we want to enmesh ourselves in our local communities as much as possible, become as, uh, as indispensable as possible at work, you know, figure out what your, uh, what your company needs and don't just do your job every day, but become good at the things that they need so that when the time comes, if, if we hit a rough patch and, uh, and there's a nasty recession that follows the, the inflation that's almost inevitable and they're laying people off, you're the last one to go. You know, these are all things you can do yourself that, uh, that don't require any input from Washington or any help from Washington. And that uh, in general, we should be doing anyhow, you know, and the, and the same thing, uh, it goes for um, your, your own self-sufficiency as far as food goes. I think uh, more and more people are growing gardens now. And that's a really healthy lifestyle in any event. But it also insulates you from disruptions in the food supply. Like if energy prices go up and you, you aren't going to get food shipped from around the world to your local grocery store anymore, well, you, you can take care of that if you've got a garden. So anyhow, it goes on and on, but uh, it, it all falls under the category of self-sufficiency. And so I, I think lifestyle is as important as finances these days and, and will become more so as time goes on. Very wise advice from our good friend, uh, John Rubino, the author of the book, The Money Bubble, What to Do Before It Pops, co-authored with James Turk. John, where can uh, people pick up a copy of this book? Well, it's on Amazon.com and you can go to dollarcollapse.com also. And uh, there's a big ad for it there. Click on the ad. It'll take you to Amazon. Perfect. Great to have you on the program today. We'll look forward to having you back on soon. Thanks, John. Great. Thanks, Jerry. Follow the money. We'll return. Attention stock traders, FTM Daily is proud to announce our latest resources for stock traders of all experience levels. Are you ready to wade in the stock trading waters? Well, unlock Jerry Robinson's trading room and receive his daily stock trading idea, complete with buy price, stop loss price, exit target, and daily trading alerts. Become an FTM Insider and unlock the trading room instantly. But perhaps one stock idea per day is not enough for you. No problem. 
Get everything in Option 1 Plus. Analyze any U.S. stock or ETF for short-term and long-term buy and sell signals with our new Trigger Trade Pro system. Find FTM Insider and Trigger Trade Pro in our online store today. Visit ftmdaily.com forward slash store or give us a call at 800-609-5530. That's ftmdaily.com forward slash store or call us at 800-609-5530. Hey friends, this is Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly. Recently, we have been receiving many emails from our listeners commenting on the great help they're getting from our precious metals expert, Tom Cloud. Gold and silver are excellent hedges against the growing threat of coming U.S. inflation. Who's your gold guy? Make it Tom Cloud. With over 30 years' experience with precious metals, Tom will answer all of your questions. Don't buy your gold and silver through some call center and pay inflated prices. Call my good friend Tom Cloud and speak directly with him and get all of your questions answered. For a limited time, Tom is offering free shipping and insurance on every gold and silver purchase made by our listeners. Call 800-247-2812. And when you do, tell him that Jerry Robinson from Follow the Money Weekly sent you. And he'll throw in that free shipping and insurance on your entire order. Call your gold guy, Tom Cloud, right now for the very best deals on gold and silver coins. 800-247-2812. That is 800-247-2812. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Here we go. Contact us anytime through our website at ftmdaily.com. And now more follow the money with Jerry Robinson. I love it. Love it. All right, Jerry. Well, at midday, the S and P 500 is at 1977. Gold is at 1301, back up over that 1300 level. And silver is at $20.81. Now, the stock market seems to uh, be ranging in this 1970 area for the past couple of weeks, but we've had some really good trades over on our trigger trade area that have really popped up. For example, just yesterday, we sold ticker symbol AMD, that's Advanced Micro Devices, and we were up over 8%. Yeah, AMD actually did very well. It was up 8.5%, as you mentioned. AMD is the second largest producer sort of microprocessors, GPUs, chipsets around the world. And uh, we had a trigger price on them at $4.39. And we had a profit potential of about 3 to 5%. Well, it popped up really nicely. We ended up making 8.5% on it. And that came right on the heels of another trigger trade that did about 10%. This market is just really hot. It just continues to rise. And we're identifying several stocks that are uh, triggering and moving higher. For those who are interested in getting a daily trading idea from us. You can do that by going to our website, ftmdaily.com forward slash store. Every evening, we send out a trading alert, a new stock idea with a price, a trigger price to buy at, a stop loss price. That way you can cut your losses. That way it doesn't go down too far. We tell you where we're placing our stop loss. And then we also tell you a little bit about the company along with our profit potential. How much are we expecting to earn from that trade? For those who want to see all of our previous trades, you can go to TriggerTradeReport.com and then just click on the Performance tab. And when you go there, you'll be able to see how all of our trades have performed. We don't hide any of our trades. We don't just show you the ones that went up. You'll see some losses on there, too. You know, we're real people. We can't always win at every single trade that we make, but uh, you'll be able to see all of them there. But you'll see that the majority of these trades do well. This is high probability trading. And if that's something that you would like to receive from us, you can go to our website, and learn more all about that. All right, friends. Well, that brings us to the end of our program once again. Thank you so much for choosing to allow us into your life each and every day. It's an honor and a privilege to be a part of yours as well. And as always, I leave you with this final word this time, just a thought. What you do today is important because you are exchanging a day of your life for it. Just something to think about. Remember, friends, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. We'll see you again right back here tomorrow. Until then, God bless. All of the information contained on Follow the Money is strictly for informational and educational purposes. The views and opinions of our guests and sponsors, including Tom Cloud and Jay Peroni, are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Robinson Media Group, LLC. 
Jerry and Jennifer Robinson do hold their insurance licenses and may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products. Jennifer Robinson is an investment advisor representative with Faith-Based Investor LLC. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always consult a 